Welcome to Cherry Street Investor Education with Kavita Baratake, passive income coach and founder of Cherry Street Investments. Education that is designed for you to take control of your financial life. Join us to learn how you can create multiple passive income streams, diversify your portfolio, save on your taxes, and much more. Become a better investor and fast track your financial goals. Here's your host, Kavita Baratake. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. This is Money Wise Learning. I'm Kavita Baratake, um, founder of Cherry Street Investments and Money Wise Learning. I've been doing this education for uh, almost 10 sessions now, which has been over six weeks. We started kind of mid-June. Uh, and today, the last session is about investing 101 stocks, bonds, and real estate. And since there seems to be enough interest, I plan for a college uh, planning webinar sometime next month. I don't know yet when yet because I'm in the middle of a big move. So I'll keep you guys posted. But this is the last scheduled session according to um, uh, our as a series of 10 sessions for Money Wise Learning. I'm Kavita Bartake, like I mentioned, and Ritesh is my... Assistant, he manages all things related to uh, the um, the webinar setup, recordings, and everything else. So, just to quickly recap on what we've covered so far uh, in MoneyWise Learning, we have talked about assets and liabilities, balance and income statements, balance sheets and income statements. We've talked about loans and interest on money. We talked about why we need insurance. We talked about Building our credit, and I did not have a guest speaker. I spoke about it. So, and then um, let me correct this while I have it here. So, we talked about building your credit, how credit and debit cards work. We talked about taxes, different kinds of taxes. We talked about retirement, how you can easily become a millionaire if you start early because of the power of compounding. We talked about getting paid, uh, what, what goes into a paycheck, what goes in a 1099, what's a W-2. I don't know how much of it you remember, but if you walked away with some knowledge and you take it forward, that'll be great. Um, always, again, expected you to do your homework because that's when the real learning happens. Uh, we also talked about budgeting, how to spend, how to save, how to give to others. And today is the last topic. We'll talk about investments. We'll talk about the stocks, stocks, bonds, and real estate investing. Again, this is meant to be an introduction to stocks and bonds and real estate, and not necessarily that you're going to become a stock market trader tomorrow, although it's up to you how much you learn after the fact um, of this presentation, how much you go investigate and learn and want to do something, right? So a few rules here, please be on mute uh, and ask your questions in the chat box still, go ahead and type it in. I will still get to the questions at the end of the discussion unless I have some time in the middle. Uh, I don't wanna derail from the discussion itself. Please mute your microphones. If, if I do ask you to share your inputs, and I will in the middle of this um, discussion, please unmute and um, also don't talk to other participants. It's obvious. You guys have been really good about these things, so I don't think I need to reinforce any of these. Uh, quick uh, look at assignment from last week. We talked about uh, review with your parents. Do they have a monthly budget? If yes, what does that budget looks like, look like? Uh, what do they use to create and track a budget? Do they use an Excel sheet? Do they use an online app? If no, um, tell me you work with your parent to create a budget. If you didn't, then don't lie to me. That's okay. <laughs> you can just tell me I talked about it to your parent. Um, you can research some budget tracking tools. Um, example, Mint, Rocket Money. There's a whole lot of them out there. How much do they save? What do they do with their savings? I don't want to really get into the dollar amounts here. You can just take, talk about a percentage if you want to. Um, so let's see. What were some of the le lessons you learned from this assignment? Anybody wants to share? You can unmute and share. Budgeting isn't necessarily restricting your money, but making a plan for how you're going to spend your money. 
That's a good point. Yeah, it's not necessarily restricting you from spending, but it's to plan for spending, right? How you're going to spend your money. Anybody else from uh, any lessons you learned from the assignment? Budgeting is very useful. Budgeting is very useful. Sure, of course. Um, anything else? Good job, Shana. Budgeting doesn't have to be a restriction. Right. Okay. But what did you learn from specifically? Let's talk about what did you learn from doing a review with your parents? Maybe something that I didn't talk about that you learned from there. I know that in India, at least, because it's more cash oriented, I know for a fact my grandparents use the envelope method. So they put right. cash into an envelope and then use that for spending. That's a good point. Yeah, India definitely. I mean, it's changing. I think it's also a generational thing. You know, the older generation is used to more dealing with cash and less with cards. And as a newer generation, I know I don't use any cash and I don't, I pretty much rely on credit cards and debit cards mostly, mostly credit cards really. Uh, and so I rely on online tools to track the spending. Any um, any percentage on how much your parents save? Anybody got something like X percent or do they have a percentage allocation for savings? If for me, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. For me, it's just I think my mom's paycheck goes to the savings account. My dad's goes to the checking account. That's a good a good a good way. A lot of people do that, where one income always goes to savings, and one income is enough to kind of sustain the household. That's quite common in dual income households. But if it's only one income household, that becomes obviously harder to do. The way I used to work is. I'd actually take away um, half of my income when I was um, salaried and then put it away and then try to live on the other half because I had these extensive goals to retire early. It's called financial independence, retire early or FIRE. You can look it up, F-I-R-E. So when you want an aggressive, aggressive scaling, uh, saving schedule to retire early, so I was technically retired at 43 uh, because I was saving a lot um, early on. So if you have, let's say, 10 years after you start working, you want to take off and go travel the world, you know, you've got to have a lot more savings to do that, to take time off from work, right? So that's part of where budgeting really becomes very handy. So we talked about the different um, giving, savings, spending and then splitting between needs and wants. Obviously, we all have wants that we don't necessarily need to have, but want to have. And so you can use like an Excel sheet simply to just track food expenses, uh, you know, transportation expenses, whatever the category might be. You can have a simple Excel sheet and say, okay, these are my expenses. This is a dollar amount that I think I'll spend every month, or this is the maximum dollar amount I want to spend. Or you can use like a complex app, like um, I use Mint. This is a, a screenshot from Mint actually, where it tracks different kinds of spending buckets. So I have auto and transport, I have bills, I have entertainment, I have food and dining, I have health and fitness, I have home, I have kids, I have miscellaneous expenses, I have personal care. So obviously some have blown the budget. You know, I had a $500 budget, I spent $743. I had a $1,000 budget, I spent $1,191. Um, lots of groceries and lots of eating out. But, you know, there's some where I'm under budget and not uh, spending as much as I you know, thought I would spend. So you can use these online tools as well for budgeting. So let's get into today's lesson. Uh, let's see, we have about 45 minutes, uh, not including the, um, the quiz. So I'm going to try to get through it, a lot of this uh, as soon as we can. So today's lesson is on Investing 101. We're going to talk about what stocks are, what bonds are, and real estate is, real estate investments are. Some of you are already familiar with a lot of these. Some of you might not be. So I want to start with real basics. And then if you guys want to add something, you're welcome to pitch in and talk about it. So what is an investment? 
An investment is really just putting in money to work with to either the goal of earning income or earning appreciation or having some kind of appreciation or both. So you can have cash flow, you can have growth, or you can have both, right? So there are some investments which are just, they just give you income. There are some investments which just give you growth, but there are some investments which give you a little bit of both. So that's basically what an investment is. Now, an investment is always oriented towards future returns. You don't know when you're making some investment, whether you're going to get paid or not paid. And there's always some element of risk. There could be a low risk in some investment. There could be a high risk. So investments are always associated with something in the future in terms of returns and always involve some level of risk. Um, and then we'll talk about the different kinds of investments and the different types of risks. So the types of investments in broad buckets, like you have cash, bank accounts, money market accounts, that's what an MMA is. Uh, we have fixed interest accounts, like we have a certificate of deposits or what's called CDs. So cash is basically pretty simple. You have a savings account, you have checking account. We talked about those. Uh, high yield savings account where you get a higher interest rate. CDs are usually a fixed term. They'll tell you, oh, it's locked up for 12 year months. It's locked up for 36 months or three years. And they'll give you a certain interest payable every month on that uh, lockup. So these are usually lower risk and lower returns. Uh, we have real estate. We have residential real estate where you go buy a house. You have commercial real estate where you can buy a car wash. You can buy an apartment building. You can buy um, a retail strip mall somewhere where, you know, um, they sell. I mean, there are different kinds of shops over there. Uh, there's various kinds of commercial investments. Uh, we have shares of stocks and funds. And we'll talk about the difference between stocks and funds as well today. We have options, which is we're not going to get to options today. That's a very complex topic. But on, in a broad term, it, an option is a way to control uh, a certain amount of stocks or funds. Okay, But you use very little money to control it. You have controlling, you have controlling power, but you don't actually own the stock. OK, you have an option to buy or sell the stock at a certain price, but you don't actually own the underlying stock. So this is sort of outside the view of today's topic. So we're not going to get there. But I just wanted to mention I started trading options, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money. So it's a fun uh, place to be, but it's also very risky. Uh, we can buy precious metals like gold, silver, and just hold them. A lot of you might have parents with gold jewelry at home. That's a kind of investment as well, although you don't probably trade that investment very often. Uh, you have crypto. I'm sure all of you have heard of crypto. You know, it's a digital currency of different kinds of coins in crypto. There's just the whole big world out there. Again, we're not going to cover crypto, precious metals, or options today, but we'll talk a little bit about everything else. And we already talked about bank accounts and money markets, so we won't get there. We'll primarily focus on three and four today. And we'll talk a little bit about bonds bonds as well. I didn't mention bonds here. So there are two different types of investments. Generally, if you look at broad buckets, one is an equity investment, the other is called a debt investment. The difference between equity and debt is really simple. In equity, you invest money to own a portion of a company. Now, that portion can be um, uh, a very small portion or a very large portion. It just depends on the company that you, the equity that you buy and how much money you put into it. It can also be a equity in a real estate world. So that's what I deal with. Let's say we buy, go buy a car wash. You can invest equity into it and own a piece of a car wash. Doesn't mean you're going to own a door of the car wash. You're just going to be co-owners in a car wash. So you have equity in the um, in the deal. What that means is if, if let's say my value goes up of the car wash, that means your, your value goes up as well because you own a portion of the company. Uh, if the value of a stock goes up, then your portion of the stock also goes up, right? Or the value of the company goes up, the, the stock price goes up. Uh, the, the other kind of investment we have is a debt investment. Uh, this is to invest money to earn a fixed interest for a specific period of time. So if I put money in um, 
uh, in a CD, it's a debt investment. If I put money, usually bonds, bonds are always debt investments. Equities are like stocks. Stocks are equity. Stocks and real estate are usually equity investments. Although you can have debt investments in real estate as well. So you can say, I'm going to loan you 10% and you can put that money towards buying whatever real estate you want to buy. Now your real estate that you, let's say you go buy a house and I can loan you 12 uh, interest rate of 12%. I'll give you some money to go buy a house. I'm basically giving you debt. So that's what a bank does when they give you a mortgage or a bank or a lender gives you a mortgage. They're giving you a debt investment, right? They are investing money into your house. And in exchange, you give them a fixed interest for a specific period of time. So what's a return on investment? Anybody know how to calculate return on investment? Anybody want to volunteer? All right. I'm going to talk about return on investment. It's a performance measure used to evaluate the efficiency of an investment. What does an efficiency mean? How much money can I make on this investment? You know, if I put in X dollars and I sell it for Y dollars, what did, what percentage uh, increase did I achieve? So let's look at the equation. It's the current value of the investment minus the cost of the investment. That's your total Current value minus cost is your total gain or total loss, right? If the current value goes down, you've lost. If the total uh, current value goes up, you've gained. Minus what you paid for it divided by minus uh, divided by what you paid for it. So let's look at an example really quick. I bought one share of Apple. I bought it for $300. Let's say I sold it for $330. So what did I make? at 330 minus 300 divided by 300, okay? That's as a percentage, you multiply that by 100 to get a percentage, right? So it's 10% return on investment. That's, that's what we, that's one of the measures we use to evaluate how good an investment is. Just one, there are multiple measures out there. Any questions on this? Let's see. Let's try to, what are the risks in investing? We'll go ahead. We'll be talking about that. So what's a good ROI on your investment? Anybody want to take a stab at this? What's a good ROI on any investment that you make? Is there a good ROI? Maybe when the price is like really, really high and it was really low when you bought it. If it's not, a, sorry, say that again, Shane. Who was answering that? Um, if the price is um really low when you bought it and then it inflation happened and now it's for a higher cost of money, you should return it and get a higher percentage ROI. back. Yeah, for sure. That's a good ROI. You can have a good ROI if you buy low, sell high. That's what she's saying, right? Um, and then 20, size says 20%, 50%. The truth is it depends on the risk you're willing to take. Right. So if I have a low risk investment, uh, I'm usually going to get lower returns. If I have a high risk investment, I can get very high ROIs. So there isn't a number that you can pin on it and say, this is the ROI you need to get. But on an average, if your money is making about 10 percent, it's good returns if the risk is low. But if you're going into a very high risk investment, if you're going into crypto and making 10 percent, you're not doing the right thing, okay? Because crypto is really high risk. So always the risk equals risk versus return has, it's a trade-off. So whenever you take more risk, you better get high returns, really high returns because you risk losing your capital. What does capital mean? The amount of money you invested is called the capital. So in a bank account, let's say you put money in, it's usually insured by FDIC. We talked about that in, during the bank accounts uh, discussion. So those are low risk investments because there's insurance by FDIC on the money up to $250,000 if you're single, right? But on the high side, let's say you invest in crypto, you could buy a coin for $50,000 like a Bitcoin. And then that 
value of the Bitcoin could drop to $20,000, right? It went from $65,000 for one Bitcoin to 11 or 20, 11,000 at the lowest, I believe, recently. So the, the thing is, when you're in a high risk investment, you're, you, you have a very high risk of losing what you put into it, right? So you want very high returns to offset that high risk that you're potentially willing to take. Uh, mentioned about options. I lost entirely, nearly my entire capital rating options, but also sometimes made uh, insane, like doubled my money in two days in options, right? So I put in 10,000, let's say I made $20,000. That's a lot of money making in one or two days, right? But that's also, that's why it's high risk, high reward. I could have lost the 10,000 also. Uh, stock trading is somewhat in between, depending on which stock you're trading, how risky it is, how volatile it is. We use the term volatile uh, to say high volatility means high movement of the stock up and down, right? Uh, then there's also mutual funds, and we'll talk about what funds are. Essentially, they're a group of stocks that you buy together. They're lower risk versus trading one stock because Let's say I'm, I'm buying one stock and tomorrow something happens to that company, the stock goes low or goes under. Uh, that's pretty high risk for me, trading sim single stocks. But if I have a mutual fund, I might have a diversification or multiple stocks within the fund. So I'm spreading my uh, investment across the multiple stocks. So if one goes down, the other might still be okay. So overall, I'm still okay. Uh, real estate tends to be Mostly a low, low, low risk investment, not always. It depends on the value of the real estate that you're investing in. Uh, because there is an entity that you're paying for. So let's say I have a cup and I say I'm going to put money into a, buying a cup. There is a physical entity that I'm buying, right? So there is value in that as long as I can sell the cup for what I bought it or more, I have value. Right. So similarly, real estate has value if you bought it at a good price. But if you bought it really high and then it drops and you try to sell it, you might lose money. So um, the risk versus reward is really, really important to analyze and make sure that you have maybe the strategy is, oh, I'm going to take a little risk. I'm going to put most of my money here in the middle and some of my money here and some of my money there, right? So generally this risk reward will change with age. As you get older, you want to take less risk because you don't, you can't stand losing a lot of money as you get older. When you're younger, maybe you take a little higher risk. So you have to figure out and there are people who don't like taking risks even if they're young. And it depends on your personality type. I'm a risk taker. So I went all the way, all the way into to options trading. I did the highest riskiest things, but now I'm kind of taming down and I'm coming down my risk. As I get older, I'm coming down my risk uh, ratio here and I'm comfortable somewhere around here. So let's talk a little bit about stock investing. So what are stocks? Companies will sell shares in their business to raise money. They might have initiatives. They might be going public. They, you, you guys have heard of companies going public. What does it really mean? They sell shares in their business in exchange for, and they get money from other people in exchange for ownership in that business. Now they can use that money to do new initiatives. They can use that money towards salary for their employees, whatever, right? They usually give you reports at the end of every quarter and say, this is how we spent the money. When you buy the stock of a company, you buy an ownership share in that company. So even if you have one stock of Tesla, you are a Tesla owner, right? Even if you have half a stock of Tesla, which you can do, it's called fractional ownership or fractional stocks. You can, you're still an owner in the company, even though you're a really small owner. So you gain in an, again, remember this is an equity position. You gain if the company grows, you lose if the company doesn't grow or the company goes downhill, right? You can go up and down with the company. So investors own stock to earn a return on that investment. That return can be two different ways. And we'll talk about that. And lastly, stocks are equity investments. So essentially owning a share of the company. 
uh, whatever kind of company that going to be. So we'll watch a quick YouTube video. I really like this video because I think uh, pictures always speak a thousand words for me. Um, so I'm going to share this really quick. Market. Presented by WallStreetSurvivor.com. This is Jimmy. Jimmy is from Miami. Jimmy is a baseball fan and has a huge baseball card collection. Jimmy, is the smart boy that he is, realizes that his collection is very valuable, especially since his Derek Jeter card has skyrocketed in value. Jimmy wants to sell his cards to buy a new skateboard. Jimmy figures his best bet is to set up shop at the local flea market which is a place where buyers and sellers meet to exchange goods. Buyers try to negotiate with sellers to get the best possible price, but often buyers and sellers meet somewhere in the middle. Mike, a huge sports fan, spots the Jeter card and asks little Jimmy what the price is. Jimmy responds that it's $100 and Mike says that he will give him 80. Jimmy suggests they meet in the middle and settle on $90. Mike agrees and the transaction happens with both parties satisfied. A flea market is a lot like the stock market, but instead of people selling products like baseball cards and pottery, the stock market allows owners to sell their shares of companies for cash. The price of the shares depends on supply and demand. How many people want to buy that stock versus how many people want to sell it? Often, just like in the flea market, buyers and sellers meet in the middle. Say for example you own 100 shares of Apple. It is trading at $300 and you're willing to sell it for $305. You call up your stockbroker and tell him to place the order. The broker won't sell the shares until a buyer is willing to meet the asking price of $305. He calls his contact who works on the NASDAQ trading floor in New York City. Every company on the NASDAQ has a stand where they are selling the shares of their stocks. Buyers come to the stand and post their bid, which is the price they are willing to pay. If there are no buyers at that price, the seller can drop the price or the buyer can increase their bid. The stock market is made up of transactions like these which happen millions of times a day in thousands of publicly traded companies. Today most of these transactions happen electronically, but the concept is still the same. Just like Mike bought the Derek Jeter card from Jimmy at the flea market, you can buy stocks from publicly traded companies on the stock market. Are you interested in buying stocks? You can learn how risk-free on WallStreetSurvivor.com. I hope that was useful. That's just a very quick overview of how stock market works. Uh, we'll now Sign up for this workshop now and we'll teach you how money works and also how to manage money. The Sorry about that. Let's stop this. Um, go back to our presentation here. We will talk about um, the types of stocks. So depending on what market capitalization, let's talk a little bit about that. What a company is worth in the market is called market capitalization. So let's say uh, a company put out a certain amount of stock, depending on the stocks they put out and the value of the stock, depending on the assets that they own, we know these terms, right? Depending on the assets that they own, their liabilities and their net worth, they have a market capitalization. The market capitalization depends on what their the what their worth is in the market. So, uh, mega cap means that they're worth more than two hundred billion. Large cap means that they're between ten and two hundred billion. Mid cap means three hundred to do two billion, and small cap is fifty to three hundred. Basically, um, the the fifty to three hundred million. If they're shares are worth that much in the open market, right? Total, in total. So can anybody answer, like, what, are, what do you think are some of the mega cap companies? Anybody wants to take a guess? You can type it in the chat box if you don't want to unmute. Apple. Apple, for sure. Tesla. Amazon. Tesla. Yep. Costco. 
I don't know if you guys have been to Costco. It's a mega cap company. Uh, Tesla, Amazon, Apple. Apple is worth like, I want to say trillions of dollars. I think 300, $3 trillion or some ridiculous number I can't even remember today. So let's talk about how you make returns on stocks. Investors can make returns on stocks in two ways. One is if the stock price appreciates, appreciation means it just goes up, right? And they can sell for a gain. Like I bought Apple for 300, I sold it for 330, I make, I make a gain. The second way is the stock will, can pay dividends, which are made to payment, uh, payments made to shareholders out of the company's earnings. And typically the company has to make a profit to be able to make a dividend. So there are a lot of companies that trade in the stock market that don't make any profits really after uh, they pay off all the expenses. Profits are basically uh, how much income they make minus expenses. What they have left is profits. And some companies don't have any profits, so they cannot pay dividends. But there are large companies like Apple and Microsoft that make a lot of profits, so they pay dividends. So not all stocks can pay dividends, but there are stocks which pay dividends. So generally, if you're, if you're holding a stock that doesn't make money um, through a dividend, you're waiting for the price to appreciate or otherwise, so you can make money on the sale, right? Why do stocks appreciate? There could be a couple of reasons, right? One is it could be an increase in value because of the demand. So what does that mean? Um, it's a supply and demand market. We saw where Jimmy was trading a card. If there's nobody to give him $305 for a $300 card that he bought for, then there's no demand, right? But if there's a lot of demand, it drives up the price. It's supply and demand. It's the basic of economics. If there is a lot of supply and no demand, the price falls. If there's a lot of demand and no, less supply, the price increases. So I don't know if you guys have watching like AMC and GameStop stock last year. It went up crazy for no absolutely no good reason, except that people created this Reddit thread um, where people said, hey, we're going to buy and trade uh, AMC stock and GameStop stock, even though the stock value itself, the company itself wasn't doing well. It was just like a meme, what they call a meme stock. They just went crazy because the demand increased. So this was a classic example of uh, demand driving the price, but while the company itself wasn't really doing anything great at that point. So the other way the stock can increase in value is the actual value or the perceived value of the company increases. So let's talk a little bit about that. If my actual earnings keep increasing are in line with the projections that investors are expecting from the company, then the value of my company is going up, right? If my potential earnings in the future look like they're going to go up because I came up with some cool technology, so I have some new growth areas, then the perceived value of my company is going up, right? A, a case in point, NVIDIA. I don't know if any of you guys know NVIDIA. They make chips, right? They make chips for computers and stuff. And they have a lot of investment into artificial intelligence, AI. So they went up like crazy recently because there's a huge growth area for that company. So investors perceive the value of the company to be high because they have AI is going to be the next big thing. And so they know that NVIDIA is going to gain business from AI. So they know that NVIDIA's potential earnings will go up. So the value of the stock immediately went up. Can everybody be on mute? Can everybody be on mute, please? All right. Uh, why do stocks lose value? So flip side, stocks could lose value for one or more reasons. One is the supply is more than the demand for the stock. So there isn't much demand, right? Nobody wants to buy the stock. And two, the companies or products um, is losing its desirability. So recently, I don't know if you guys know, but Bed Bath & Beyond, a very big chain, went out of business and their stocks went down, right? Because they couldn't compete with Amazon. They couldn't compete with all these online stores. 
Or let's say you're making a product that's obsolete, nobody's using that anymore. Then if you're a one product company or you make set of products which is not useful for people anymore, you could lose, your stock could lose value. You have a stronger product in, in the market or products. So let's say your comp competition comes out with this really amazing product and that makes your product look like not so great. You could lose, um, your stock could lose value. You have declining year on year growth. So let's say from last year to this year, instead of growing a growing business, you have a declining business. Investors don't want to invest within your stock anymore, right? They're going to start pulling money out and put money somewhere else. So you, you could actually be on the losing end of a stock if you are a company like that. Lastly, but not ex extensively, um, it could be reliance on a single product. So let's say there, there are a lot of biotech companies, they develop vaccines. They just have one vaccine. And if that vaccine doesn't work, guess what? Their product fails. Their entire stock fails, right? Like it could be trading for pennies instead of trading for hundreds of dollars. Last but not least, bankruptcy and other legal battles. And this is what happened to Best. Um, so Bed Bath & Beyond recently, they claimed uh, they, they filed for bankruptcy. Or let's say someone sues your company and you're public and you lose a lot of money in that legal battle or you lose that legal battle, then your stock could fall in value because now the net assets owned by your company or your net worth of your company is going down and they might have sued you for... I don't know, hundreds of reasons, but net effect investors don't like the fact that you are in a legal battle and it's going to cost uh, the company money because investors basically are part of that company, right? So as I was telling you, NVIDIA recently, so I was trading NVIDIA when it was $9 around 2016, 17. That's when I was trading NVIDIA. It's now $463 ridiculous imagine if you had bought just put in nine dollars uh 10 12 years ago you could have 463 dollars now imagine if you had put 900 dollars right you could have 46 thousand i don't know whatever that 46 thousand dollars right now so it has gone up just um 50 somebody can read it 56,374 percent since they released that stock right since they went ipo it's called initial public offering so when they went ipo it it talks about the uh, it's the initial it's almost like maybe it opened for a dollar two dollars i don't know whatever this number was i can't even read it here but that's what it is at today 463 dollars so we're talking about a company which went under, went bust. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond recently went bust. Uh, in their highs, they were trading at about $79 a share. And obviously right now they're $0.28, $0.28 cents a share. They're going to be delisted soon from the exchange because nobody wants to really buy in a company that went bankrupt. They, they sell the assets and they close down shop. Can you think of some of the stocks that have boomed? Anybody want to take uh, answers? Boom stocks. You guys already actually talked about Bitcoin. some of them. Sorry? Bitcoin. Can you type it in the chat box? Because I'm not able to hear it. AMD. Um, I don't know if AMD has really boomed as much. Bitcoin is not a stock. It's cryptocurrency. So we're not we're not talking about crypto here, but uh, stocks. Let's say Amazon, Tesla. Uh, they Amazon started as a bookshop, online bookshop, right? They were worth maybe nothing when they came to the market, but now they're worth uh, hundreds of dollars, and they've split so many times. Stock split as well. Um, Tesla, Nvidia. I gave you an example of Nvidia. Similarly, Microsoft. Whole Foods after Amazon bought it. Sorry? Starbucks, yeah. Starbucks too, for sure. Okay, can you think of some of the stocks that have busted? Anybody? Busted stock. Twitter, for sure. AMC busted. AMC and GameStop busted. Why did AMC bust? People stopped watching movies during COVID, right? Uh, they weren't doing so well. 
they're kind of okay, but they're still not doing so hot. So a lot of stock go busted if the products they're offering is not uh, good anymore. Roblox busted. I had no idea. Are they public? Are Roblox public? <coughs> also, um, Rivian, the electric car company. Did they go bust? Yes. Okay. So they'll probably be back. They're probably going through a down cycle because the product they are offering it's pretty solid, right? They're they're doing uh, EV cars and uh, I believe they're doing trucks and SUVs as well. So I think eventually the EV market will be up, but it's not really a declining market, you know, for EVs, uh, electric vehicles, it's a upward going market. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond is gone forever. That's correct. They're not coming back. So now we'll talk about funds investing 101. So what are funds and how are they different from stocks? This should work, okay. So funds let you pool your money with other investors to buy stocks, bonds, and other investments. We haven't talked about bonds. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, the other investments can be, can be real estate too. So they're usually run by professional money managers who decide what securities to buy. They could decide to buy stocks, bonds, real estate, and when to sell them. So. The good thing about funds is you can buy a fund and you can get a whole bunch of stock as a part of that fund. Instead of investing in one stock, you get to invest in many stocks. Invest, instead of investing in one bond, and we'll invest in many bonds. Instead of investing in one real estate, one piece of real estate, you might invest in a, a, a multiple pieces of real estate. So it's a way for you to kind of pool money from other people and buy more right? That's what a fund is. So you get exposure to all the investments in the fund and any income that they generate. So let's say I have a fund where I have some stocks and I have some other kinds of investments like stocks in Apple, Tesla, but also a smaller company. So let's say Apple and Tesla aren't doing so well. It happened earlier this year, but the other company is doing better. So it could offset some of the down, stocks which are down and um, you know help with some of the stocks which are going up. Sometimes you might invest in one fund here and one fund there. One fund might be down, the other fund might be up. So the more you can diversify, which means buying different kinds of investments instead of the same kind, the better exposure you have because if one goes down, the other might not go down at the same time, right? So let's talk about the different kinds of funds. Primarily, there are two kinds of funds in the market. One is called an ETF or exchange traded fund. The other one is, uh, is called a mutual fund. Now, what is a common between exchange traded fund and I'll call them ETFs and mutual fund? Both are less risky than buying individual stocks and bonds because individual stocks could go here or there. The company could shut down. Let's say you went and bought Best Buy, the company shut down. You lost all your money, right? If you put all your money there, you lost all your money. But instead of going and buying just Best Buy, let's say you bought into a fund that had a whole bunch of other retail stores. Let's say it had Costco, it had Best Buy, it had something else. So maybe Best Buy died, Best Buy died, but Costco is doing really, really well. So overall your fund could be really uh, not so hurt by one thing going down, depending on what its exposure is to that one stock. Uh, both are again, ETFs and funds are both managed by professional managers. And both offer a wide variety. So you could invest in a fund, which would say small cap fund, which invests in only small cap companies, which is five to $30 million companies. You could invest in a mega cap fund or a large cap fund, which invests in only the large companies. You could invest in a mid cap fund, which invests in the mid cap companies. You can invest in an international fund, international stock fund, which invests in other countries. You could invest. So there's a whole bunch of funds out there. And even within the country, there's lots of exposure. Let's say I want to invest in all the oil companies because I think the price of oil will do well. Then I could invest in a fund which invests in different oil companies like Exxon, Mobil, um, uh, Citgo, I don't know, whatever oil companies are out there, right? So depending on with the fund, you're not investing in one stock, but you're getting diversification or exposure to multiple stocks 
within the fund. Instead of one piece of ownership, you're sharing the pool with a lot of other investors. So let's look at the exchange differences between ETFs and mutual funds. Usually in ETFs, you can start with very low minimums. So you can buy even fractional ETFs, I believe. Uh, here, mutual funds, it's usually a higher investment amount. It's the medium to high. But there is an investment minimum. It might have a $5,000 minimum on a mutual fund, right? The expense ratio is the amount of fees that is charged on the fund. Because uh, let's say I'm a fund manager managing a fund. I'm going to charge you fees in exchange for managing your money in the fund. Because now I have to make a decision on when I'm going to buy, when I'm going to sell, what I'm going to invest in. That, that it needs time, my time, so I need to get paid. So there's a, something called expense ratio, which is uh, the amount of money that you spend in expenses on the fund. So it's usually low for an ETF and medium to high for a mutual fund. So you have to be very careful when you're investing in mutual funds because you can have a lot of fees in the fund and it will take away from the returns. So they say they make 10%, but if you make two, you pay 2% in fees, you net effect don't get 10% of returns from the mutual fund. Uh, the other difference is that um, real-time pricing, what that means is ETFs are like stocks. The value goes down the whole day. So I could trade in one minute. It could be a different price. Then the next minute, it changes from minute to minute, right? The pricing keeps changing on the market. Whereas in mutual funds, it's a daily pricing. So it's the pricing is the close price of the end of the day. So it doesn't change so drastically. So in general, it's great. Mutual funds are good for retirement accounts because one, the daily pricing, you're not sitting there waiting to buy a mutual fund. You just put an order in and you forget about it, right? And you can create an automated transaction. So every month, let's say you put in $1,000 in your retirement account. You can say, I want to buy this fund, this fund, this fund, and this, this percentage. $1,000, $200 goes here, $200 goes there, $200 goes to the third fund and forget about it, set it and forget it, right? You wanna go back and visit it sometimes maybe, but you don't have to really mess with it. ETFs, generally you can't do repeated automatic transactions, although there are brokerages which might offer you to set up transactions and say, what price do you want to pay, pay for it? And you can set up based on the price that day. Uh, there's tax efficiency. Usually um, uh, it's, um, high tax efficiency, which means you pay low taxes, because what happens in ETFs is the fund manager isn't buying and selling and buying and selling very much. So that doesn't create a tax event for you. Every time you buy and sell, you have to pay taxes if you're making money. Okay. So within the fund, the manager could be buying and selling. Uh, so you, your fund basically, your uh, investment basically gets taxes. So usually ETFs have lower taxes and funds have higher taxes. Although let's say you put money in a retirement account and that goes, your manager in the retirement account is selling and buying a lot of stock. Remember, you don't get taxed on everyday stuff in your retirement account, right? You get taxed when you pull money out of a retirement account, usually a 401k. It's a traditional 401k. So you're not really worrying about taxes very much in retirement accounts. I want to really, uh, no discussion be complete by talk without talking about index funds. So what is an index fund? Uh, a type of a mutual or exchange traded fund that seeks to track the returns of a market index. So what is a market index? So we have different market indices and our indexes. Uh, like um, S&P 500, NASDAQ, and others. So they basically track the broader market, and we'll talk about them for a second here. Um, so with index funds, you don't buy or sell them very often within the fund, so it doesn't create a lot of transaction. And it's also a low cost of management for index funds. So a lot of um, retirement investors and stock investors prefer to invest in index funds because it gives you diversification across a lot of stocks. Um, and then broader market performance diversification. And we'll talk about this a second here. So example is S&P 500. It's the 500 largest companies uh, listed on, it's called S&P or Standard and Poor. 
500 companies and you invest in all the 500 companies by just putting a dollar or $10 in, right? Which is pretty cool. So obviously you're getting fractional shares, but your share go, your dollar goes into that pool and the pool buys uh, into all these companies in a specific allocation. So let's look at the S&P 500 index uh, over a period of time. That index has gone up 200, 2,696%, right? Now we saw the NVIDIA stock, it was 52,000% over a period of time. Obviously the returns there are very high, 2,600 versus 56,000%. But this S&P 500 is a much safer bet because NVIDIA could have been low as well, right? Because it's one stock. Instead of that, you're getting 500 stocks by investing in the five, S&P 500. So what are the popular indexes, stock market indices do you guys know of? Anybody? You can type it in the chat box. So let me talk about this. The most fo followed stock market indexes or indices are Dow Jones Index or Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's what it's called. NASDAQ Composite and S&P 500, they're the top three indices uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the US. Every country has their own market, own indices. So this is the US indices. Now, NASDAQ is like the top thousand companies that are all the companies listed in the NASDAQ stock exchange actually make up the composite in NASDAQ. And stock exchange is just a place you go to list your company or to sell the stock of your company, okay? So that could be listed on NASDAQ. It could be listed on Dow Jones. Uh, Dow Jones are actually the oldest companies. I think, I believe there are 30 companies only in Dow Jones Index. And then S&P 500 is the 500 companies. So um, we'll see if there are any questions. That's a lot of information, I realize. Uh, let's talk about bonds. What are bonds? So the difference between stocks and bonds is that bond is a debt instrument. It's a debt investment versus an equity investment. What that means is it's a loan from an investor to a borrower, such as a company or a government. So if you give money, if you give $100 to the U.S. government and buy a bond from them, you're basically giving a loan to the U.S. government and saying, okay, in exchange for my $100, you're going to give me 8% a year or 5% a year, whatever that negotiated amount is. So what it is, is a loan from you as an investor to someone who's taking the money from you. Return. It pays the investor a fixed rate of return over a specific period of time. So let's say you invest in a government bond, the government, US government, uh, it's called a treasury bond. Now they might tell you, I'm gonna give you 6% for the next six months or the next 12 months in exchange for you giving me $10,000. So you're gonna get $600 a year with 6% of 10,000 every year, depending on, they might adjust their rates as well, right? A risk, a bond's risk is based on the creditor's issue, uh, uh, issuer's credit worthiness and payout. I don't know what that V is, ignore that. So if I am not very credit worthy, let's say I'm a, I'm a small company, then the risk is high, right? So I'm gonna give, have to give you more to come to me because my risk is high, I'm a small company. If you go to the US government, it's, it, it basically the risk is very low because the gov they can always print money and give more money back to you, right? The US government is one of the safest uh, bonds that you can buy, the treasury bonds. And then there's value. So let's say I bought a bond two years ago, uh, giving me an interest rate of 3%. Would the value of the bond right now be higher or lower? Because the market interest rate went up so much. It went from the Fed funds rate went from 0% to 5.5% as of yesterday. Would the value of my bond that pays 3% a year be higher or lower right now? Anybody? Lower, not higher. The reason is 
I have a bond that pays 3%. The market, like I can get 5% in a, in a bank account right now. Why would anybody want to buy my bond? Nobody wants to buy my bond. It pays only 3%. But two years ago, that 3% was a lot of money because bank accounts were paying 0.5% or 0.75%. And now bank accounts are paying 4 to 5%. So my 3% bonds value goes down. So remember, it depends. Market in interest rates go up, your bond value goes down. So bonds are not great doing great in this market, especially if you bought them earlier. But if you go buy a treasury bond right now, you and inflation was what, 8%, your bond was paying like 7 to 8%, okay? So what are the types of bonds? I talked about US treasury bonds issued by the government, backed by the US government. It's one of the safest investments in the world, actually. And example is like I bonds. I actually invest in I bonds because they match the inflation rate. What is inflation? The cost of buy, uh, you know, um, basically buying every, any or the price of money. If inflation is high, your money is worth less. The same dollar is worth less. If the inflation is low, your money is worth more. It can buy more, right? Buy more things. Um, not to get into inflation today, but let's talk about corporate bonds. Let's say I'm Coca-Cola. I want to go build a, a new plant in uh, Mexico for canning Coca-Cola, I don't know, uh, to make Coca-Cola, to make more money, right? To make more, bar, uh, to increase my production. Then I might uh, issue a corporate bond and Coca-Cola is a strong company. They've done well for many years. So they might issue, say, I, we want to raise $100 million or whatever, a billion dollars, and we want to create a new plant in Mexico. So you might invest in Coca-Cola and say, okay, give me 10% for investing with you guys, so 8% in exchange for buying that bond, right? So in within corporate bonds, there's high-yield bonds or investment-grade bonds. Generally, the high-yield bonds mean that it's high risk, right? High, high return high risk. Remember that, right? So if I'm a small company and I'm going to give you a bond, I'm going to create a corporate bond. I might offer a high return to you, but it comes at a high risk because I'm a very small company and I could go bust. But if uh, Coca-Cola is offering a bond, it's probably an investment grade bond because it's a strong company. So high risk, high returns, low risk, low returns. Finally, the third type of bond, very important, municipal bonds. What are these? They're issued by the states, cities, counties, and non-federal, right? Federal is U.S. Treasury bonds. That's federal government. Any, anybody who is not federal but government, it's called municipal bonds. They're also called munis, munis M-U-N-I-S. So they issued by the state, they could issue, be issued, let's say I'm in Williamson County, Williamson County might start a bond and say, hey, here's a bond, we're going to try to raise money for the county, uh, you're, you're welcome to buy it in. They might give you tax benefits, so they might waive any state taxes or local taxes on that income from the bond. So Texas doesn't have a state tax, so not very useful, but they might waive local taxes on the on the income that you make can be short term long term what does that mean i can tell, tell you this is a bond just for 12 months or i'll say this is a bond with the expiry date of 5 years so for 60 months i have your money if i'm a company it's a long term bond so let's talk about the differences between bonds and stocks. I know it's a lot of information and it's going to be a lot of information in this deck um, and you're going to have to probably go back and watch this again. So bonds are basically debt investments, which means I'm basically exchanging cash with you and then you promise me a specific rate of interest in exchange for the cash. Stocks on the other hand are equity investments they give you ownership into a company, right? And you get voting rights and you might get dividends from the company if the company is profitable, they're making profits. So typically they are traded differently. They're traded in an exchange here versus what we call over the counter. 
not important. You guys don't need to remember that. Bonds are generally lower risk, lower returns. Stocks are generally higher risk, higher return. Not always, right? If I go to a small company and buy their bond for a high yield bond for a high return, I might be higher risk. So you kind of have to evaluate the investment versus let's say I go buy Amazon stock, it might be lower risk. Amazon is taking over the world, right? So typically bonds overall, if you look at it since 1929, have returned about 6% every year, whereas stocks have returned about 10% every year. Now there might be down years, up years, we are looking at the average over a period of time, right? They can be corporate bonds, municipal bonds, or treasury bonds. These are issued by companies. Stocks are issued by companies as IPOs or initial public offering. It means when a company starts trading, it's called an IPO, initial public offering. They're basically saying, hey, we're going public. You guys can buy stocks in my company. Okay. So why invest in bonds? It's usually lower risk, depending on the kind of bond you're buying. It's fixed income. So let's say I buy a piece of stock in Amazon. They might not give, Amazon is a bad example. Let's say I buy a piece of stock in a small company, which doesn't make any profits yet. They might not give me any dividends. So I might not realize any money from that investment until I sell that investment, right? Sell the stock. But let's say I want ongoing income every month, then I might invest some in bonds because now I have a fixed rate of income coming in every month. I might also diversify my portfolio. What does that mean? I put my eggs in multiple baskets instead of just one. If I buy all the stock, one stock of one company and that company goes down, I might lose my money. So instead I'll buy some stock, some mutual funds, some... Uh, some bonds. And so different uh, investments have different risks. So I'm spreading my investments across multiple buckets or uh, baskets. And then I'm going to get maybe high return, high risk in one and low return, low risk, but I balanced it out. Okay. And then finally, you might get tax benefits if you in, in invest in municipal bonds. You guys ready for real estate investing? I know it's a lot of information. If you have any questions, uh, type it in the chat box. I'll go back through it later, okay? So what kind of real estate investments are out there? I, I do a lot of real estate investments, so that's my forte. So you could buy a house. It's called a residential investment. That house could be one house or it could be multiple houses, right? I could buy two houses in one. It's called a duplex. I don't know if you've ever seen those kind of houses where you have one roof and then there are two little homes side by side. So you can have an apartment building. You guys have all seen apartment buildings. You can have an office building. You can have a retail strip center where you go shopping to HEB or to your grocery stores. Um, you can have industrial buildings like warehouses and uh, factories. So there could be a different, a lot of different types of investments out there, real estate wise, and not just like house. House is not the only kind of real estate investment. So we'll talk really quick, see a video on real estate investing for beginners. I like videos because sometimes, you know, I can talk a lot of words, but you just see something really quick, you get a better idea. Have you ever wondered how real estate investing works? It's an important question. Among houses, apartments, offices, hotels, and industrial buildings, there's over $35 trillion invested in real estate. But how does real estate investing really work? Fortunately, the basics are pretty straightforward. Let's look at a simple example. Imagine you purchase a house for $500,000, which you plan to rent to tenants. Typically, for a $500,000 property, your investment includes a 20% down payment, $100,000, and an 80% mortgage, $400,000. We call this $100,000 of equity and $400,000 of debt. To simplify the math, ignore closing costs for now. Congratulations, you own a rental property. Now what? Find your tenants. 
There's a similar nearby house that rents for $2,500 a month. You match that. That's $30,000 a year in gross rental income. Once the cash is flowing, your total return is that amount minus expenses and mortgage interest, plus the change in your property's value over time. Let's walk through that in more detail. You have to pay your property taxes and insurance, as well as some ongoing operating and maintenance costs. Let's say $5,000. Mortgage interest is your other major expense. Your $400,000 mortgage might have a 4.5% interest rate. That's another $18,000 in costs. So, $7,000 a year in residual income. $7,000 divided by your $100,000 investment equals a 7% annual return in cash flow. For simplification, we're ignoring things like income tax and depreciation. But there's more than just cash flow. You can also benefit from potential appreciation in both the rent and property value. The industry rule of thumb is 3% per year of appreciation. Altogether, you might make 7% a year in rent and 3% in appreciation. That's a 10% annual return over the long term. For comparison, the stock market has an average historical return of about 8% return a year. In fact, real estate has outperformed stocks over the past 30 to 40 years. But not everyone has the time or money to be a landlord. That's why Fundrise has built the first easy-to-use online platform for real estate investing. Imagine. I think that's enough. So essentially, the idea is that you go buy um, real estate of some sort, or you invest with someone who buys real estate of some sort, and then you get cash from the real estate, like whether it's a rental property with tenants in it, with the apartment building with tenants in it, or you might have a car wash where cars are wa being washed every day and that makes money. And then you collect that money and then you pay for the expenses. And then whatever is left is money that can be given to the investor or investors in the property. So how is real estate investment make money? One is rental income. The income from whatever money the real estate is making pays down the mortgage. We remember we talked about mortgage and that increases the equity of the property. The other way is the property can appreciate or increase in value. And we talked about that 3% appreciation every year. That's not a rule of thumb. That's not like everybody appreciates 3%. Sometimes it can go up 10%. Sometimes it can go up, it can come down, right? But generally over a period of time, it appreciates increasing equity. Equity is ownership, okay? Finally, realist rental income also provides some cash flow, hopefully, otherwise you shouldn't be buying it after paying all the expenses. And lastly, it provides tax advantages that we didn't talk of today, but generally on a rental property, let's say I own a rental property, if I make money, I don't usually pay taxes because there's something called depreciation which comes in and that saves me money on taxes. So I can actually make tax-free money on real estate, which is why a lot of people love investing in real estate. I love in real estate investments, and that's what I primarily do. So let's look a little bit at stock versus real estate investing really quick. Generally, the difficulty level in stock, I'd say, is relatively easy. You can just go open an online account and trade stocks very easily. Real estate is a little bit more involved. You just don't go back and buy a house in like 10 seconds, you know, or an hour even. It takes days and months sometimes to buy real estate. The investment amount, if you have $100 to invest, you probably cannot go buy real estate, right? Real estate costs a lot more money than that, but you can definitely go buy a piece of stock or even a fractional share of stock, right? You can go and start a trading account with $100 and you can start buying stocks today. Uh, so stocks are definitely easier to invest into and need small amounts of money. Uh, stability of investment though, stocks can be all over the place. Real estate is really doesn't change as much depending on the market. Some, some markets like Miami or Vegas, they can be a little volatile, but generally real estate goes up slow, comes down slow, okay? 
and there's a tangible asset. There's no real tangible asset. The company you're investing in might have some assets, right? They might have factories, they might have people, but it's not something tangible that you directly own. In real estate, you either own a house, you own a property with other people. You, there is a tangible asset that you can go touch, see, feel, right? So if you want to go invest in a real estate piece, in a, in a house, you can generally touch the house. That's what tangible means. Uh, there are generally no tax advantages with stocks. There are some exceptions, but there are lots of tax advantages with real estate, which is why you definitely want a good a portfolio to have real estate in it. Uh, liquidity is yes in one and no in the other. It's very hard to just make money in a house and sell it tomorrow in a day. You can sell your stock in the next hour, right? As long as the stock market's open, you can go sell your stock. That's what liquidity means. Liquidity means how quickly you can get your money back. So stock market is very liquid. Real estate, not so much. So again, we uh, revisit this risk versus rewards uh, returns um, scenario here. Uh, we talked about real estate, talked about mutual funds. We talked about stocks. We did not cover options or crypto. But generally, you can see on the continuum with the higher risk and higher returns and low risk and low returns. That's kind of your risk reward ratio there. So you want to kind of diversify and say, I'm going to keep some money in cash. I'm going to keep some money in real estate. I'm going to probably buy some gold and silver and other metals. I might invest in mutual funds, stocks. I might even do some crypto, but I'm not going to put all my money up here, nor am I going to put all my money down here. I'm going to diversify or move it in across all these different buckets. So what does diversification mean? Just what I just said. If I have three baskets and I say I can buy gold, I can buy real estate, I can buy stocks, and there could be bonds, there could be some other baskets there, right? I'm going to put some money in each one. What does that mean to me? I'm going to reduce exposure to any specific investment instead of putting everything in real estate or everything in stock or everything in gold. I'm going to put it across different investments and then not put all my eggs in one basket, right? Because if that basket drops and falls, all my eggs are gone, right? So what's a typical portfolio? I like to think about it as stocks being 30% and real estate being 30%. Personally, I'm very real estate heavy. I'm trying to be get back into stocks because I actually lost a lot of money uh, during the 2008 crash and I waited until I could recover and I pulled a lot of money out of stocks. So now it's the time for me to go back into stocks and buy more. I might buy some precious metals. I might have 10% in cash. I might have 10% in life insurance policies. I might have 10% in bonds. So that's a pretty diversified portfolio where I'm not putting all my eggs in one investment basket. So what's next for you guys? What do, you, what do I want you guys to do with this? Uh, we'll talk about the questions which come out of this, but what I recommend is you guys go and look at this stock market simulator. Uh, Wall Street Survivor has a cool simulator where you can get $100,000 in paper money, you know, in um, bucks, and you can trade there and you can learn how the stock market works. You can visit the treasury bonds to look at what kind of bonds are out there, treasurydirect.gov. Uh, there's, a, there's a website called nerdwallet.com. You can explore index funds, ETFs, mutual funds, learn all about this, right? I want you guys to learn. And uh, cash flow game, we have talked about it almost every class, richdad.com. It's a great way to learn how to buy assets and uh, reduce your liabilities, how to increase your net worth, how assets make money for you, right? Liabilities take money away from you. Um, I also want you guys to look at, um, I think I clicked on something there. Mm. Let me share my screen again, one second. All right. Uh, so here's your homework, which we won't be meeting the next time to review this, but it would be good for you guys to understand uh, what kind of 
investments your parents have, talk to them about this. Um, do they have outside of bank accounts and fixed deposits? What kind of investments do they have? Make a list of the investments in a Google sheet. Let's say cash, bank account is cash. Fixed deposit is also kind of cash. Then stocks, bonds, real estate, alternatives. You know, alternatives could be any other kind of investment. The dollar amount for each type of investment. Maybe you go to your Google sheet, like an Excel sheet, and put stocks, the type of investment, and the amount of dollar amount. And then you have a pie chart option in Google uh, uh, Google, where you can create a pie chart showing what percentage is in what category. It would be a cool exercise for you guys to go do that because you really get an idea of what your diversification pie chart looks like. Remember, I, I showed this pie chart here. What does that pie chart for them look like? How much do they have in bonds? How much do they have in stocks? How much do they have in, do they have a life insurance policy, which is a whole life policy? Do they have cash? Do they have real estate? You know? Uh, so you can do something like that. That would be really cool. Ask them how you can invest with them or help them uh, invest. So maybe you can set up your own small trading account with $100 and learn to really invest with real money. Maybe you can go to the stock simulator and invest with paper money, like not real money. So also independently, if you can do these things, you can join a simulated stock trading league and learn how to paper trade. You can set up a challenge among you guys or your friends and say, okay, we're all going to go to uh, Wall Street Survivor and we're going to set up a league. It's a stock trading league. And then when whoever wins the first prize, you know, let's say you're getting $100,000, how much can you make it in like a month? And so at the end of four weeks, you can decide who wins and gets a reward. Um, you can study about the different kinds of investments. You can play the cash flow game. Um, also, I think crypto has its value. You need to learn about crypto. Um, if you haven't done any research about crypto, learn about that, what kind of investments um, you can have with crypto. I know it's been really long and this is a very long deck. Uh, so I'm going to take questions now because I had to cover so much today. So it's definitely gone, not going to be an hour. Um, so Sai asked, you can actually invest in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I thought it was to show you how the market is doing. Yes and no. There are indexes. So there are um, indexes which tra track the Dow Jones. So for example, SPDR, like spider, SPDR is the ticker symbol. You can actually look it up. SPDR will track the S&P 500. So you can directly invest in S&P 500 but you can invest in spider. So there are, that is a, that is a qu question of how the market is doing, but there are indices, uh, there are stock, there are funds which track the indices and they're called index funds, okay? Can a bond be forever? Generally not, they'll usually take your money for a, for a specific length of time. They are going to tell you how, how long it is. Or says he has a call, a call with his college counselor. He'll watch this video later. I didn't understand the cash flow game. Okay. Uh, don't have a chance to explain the game here, but um, happy to do it offline if you have any questions about the game. Any other questions? We'll have a quiz soon. So any other questions from today? I know it was a lot of information and I was kind of thinking, oh my God, is this too much? But I hope I simplified it enough. How do you know it's the right time to invest? You really never know, right? You really never know. You have to do your best judgment and some research to figure out, is this the right time to buy this kind of asset, right? Like it might be the right time to buy real estate, I think maybe end of this year, early next year. It's going to go up because we are in that market where it's hitting a low, but it might go down some more, but what do I care? I'm going to hold it through the downturn and sell it on the upturn. It's going to go up at some point, right? So I don't really know where the bottom is, but I can just invest and hold it through the bottom, right? Uh, but then again, a lot of people tend to buy when it's very high and everybody's happy and it's crazy, but that's a time you don't want to buy. So it's kind of counterintuitive and it's very, very high and everybody's really happy in the market. You want to stay away, right? You want to, you want to look at something which is down. So it's better to invest in something which is down to wait for it to come back as long as you're confident that it will come back. Can you invest in mega and small caps? Absolutely. You can invest in 
mega, you can invest in large, you can invest in small, you can take a piece of, let's say you have $1,000, you can invest a little bit in this, a little bit in that, a little bit in this, you can diversify across mega, small, mid cap, international stock, and whatever else is out there. There's a lot out there. I would love if you guys would scan this code and I want your feedback for the entire 10 sessions on how I can do better and how you didn't like something or liked something or anything, anything. I love if your parents could take a scan of this and I'll make sure I send it via email as well, uh, this feedback form. Uh, if you guys can just scan the QR code it right now. Uh, you should be able to go to the feedback form and please ask your parents or you're welcome to use it as well. I'd just like some feedback from you so we can do better on the next session. Maybe we'll do it next summer. Maybe we'll do it earlier if there's more interest. So thank you all for joining in and um, thank you for staying with me for 10 sessions if you've been able to. Thank you for listening online if you are. I appreciate you and I hope you learned something out of it. And again, remember, you're not going to remember everything that I said here, and that's okay. Even if you remember 10% of what we taught in these sessions, uh, you'll be better off than you were before you learned these things. So thank you for joining in. Hi, I'm Kavita Bhattake. I hope you found this video useful. And if you did, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can get notified of any future videos I upload. I plan to cover a lot of investor education on this channel and I hope you'll stay with me for it. If you have any feedback on future content you'd like to see me cover, please drop me a note or a comment on my video. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me.